Uh, welcome back to Questing Beast, everyone. I'm Ben, and today we are doing another episode where we are asking or answering questions from our viewership. But today I am joined with two luminaries of the uh, D&D YouTube sphere. I'm here with Seth Skorkowski and with uh, Professor Dungeon Master from Dungeon Craft. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Seth, do you want to just introduce yourself a little bit and what your channel is about? Um, well, Adam says Krakowski. I uh, I'm talk about lots of different role playing games as well as general tips and suggestions, or sometimes just stupid, stupid videos because I was in a mood. Uh, untrue, untrue. <laughs> a lot of general stuff. It's under the highly imaginative name Seth Skorkowski, um, because I'm a, I'm a novelist and I at least wanted my name associated with everything was the original plan. And then I ended up becoming a bigger YouTube personality than novelist. So it just kind of worked out that way. Yeah. You know his channel is good because he beat me at two years ago at the Any Awards for Best Online Content. Um, and it's well-deserved. I love his channel. <laughs> I'll put links down in the description below where you can check that out yourself. Um, and Professor, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Professor Dungeon Master. My channel is called Dungeon Craft, and I talk about role playing games and also building terrain a little bit as well. Fantastic. I feel like I should get some more terrain building people on here since a lot of them are into D&D as well, but maybe that'll be a different video. Um, so we're just going to get into some of the questions that uh, were submitted, both from patrons and just from the general viewership, and we'll just uh, discuss them and see what we think about them. So um, our first question comes from Colin Sproul, I think you say his name. It says, uh, I need a better way to introduce the concept of hirelings to my players that are new to old school play or new school play, you know, whatever. Um, how do you do that? Um, Seth, do you have any ideas on that? Well, back in the day when the world was young, uh, they were introduced to it because it was just right there in the player's handbook how much they cost. So when they're looking through and they're buying a horse and uh, some extra arrows, they're like, hey, how much is a light footman? Can I buy one of those? <laughs> so I mean, that was that was how, the, how we were introduced. But if you want to introduce it into a game, um, there's there's a couple ways. One, if they if the heroes meet other adventurers who have all of these entourage with them and if, if they're like more powerful they could even kind of like make comments how they don't have all the footmen and valets and, and all of that um they could also be approached by a lowly medium footman or something offering their services uh to them if you want to if, you, if you've got a really fun npc personality he could walk up and you know offer his services as a as something like that but the other one is just show them the price list and uh, just let it naturally happen. Yeah, just add it to the menu where it, yeah. whenever they go shopping. Uh, Professor, how about you? Do you run parties with lots of NPCs that players can control? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I do it with a bulletin board. Mm. So this is something I crafted. And this is all the adventure hooks as well as father of four needs work. We'll fight, we'll carry, won't complain. <laughs> Ask for dead meat, Dirk at the greased goat. And then if you if you meet dead meat, Dirk, he will talk and he'll say, yes, please, you know, I have four children. And then when they hire him the next day, at least three of his four children will serve up to be their hirelings. And uh, and that's that's how you hire them. That's a great idea, because I, I just know a lot of people who you know, want to have hirelings in their games. So they think that's just a fun idea. Um, but the players are just not used to it. They just want to be a party. So they never even consider it. Um, one thing that I heard from someone is that if you want players to really get into that mode of having hirelings, you can just start the game with them having hirelings. Um, start the game like the beginning of the adventure. Guess what? You all have two NPCs that are just in your service. So they immediately get into the habit of dealing with that. Um, so the next question. I, I thought Sorry, Professor Dungeon Master real fast was about to do the, uh, the the total recall. I got five kids to feed. <laughs> <laughs> Three games later, I got four kids to feed. <laughs> well, if they have if they have enough kids, then if their dad dies, you know, a kid can just take his place. You know, now he sends them. <laughs> <laughs> That's even better. He doesn't go. He doesn't go. 
Then they all want to protect the hirelings because they feel terrible. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Introducing kids into your party can just be terrifying because the, the party will just act completely differently because they'll just, everything will be about protecting them. That would be great. And then the kid dies and then like his brother just like comes down the dungeon steps to replace him. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. Our next question is from Sean. If you had a blank check for a project budget, what's the most experimental or ambitious RPG pr product you'd like to try creating? Um, Professor, do you want to start with that one? I have very little ambition, and I'm I'm working on my own rule set now. It's called Deathbringer, and it's, it's a lot like it's a lot like Nave, you know, rules light. Um, you know, I've come to the conclusion that I don't need new game systems. I think that the skeleton of D and D works well enough. So you really have to have if you're going to design something, you either have to have something totally new and innovative or just have a higher quality and better than everybody else has it. And I, and I think that there are innovative people. Um, Amber Diceless Role-Playing is very innovative. Castle Falkenstein, very innovative. But I'm not an innovative person like that. So I have no ambitions of running, you know, designing a game that would be very impressive. And I think that the, the strength, intelligence, wisdom, Charisma, hit points, armor class works perfectly well. Mm -hmm. And that I would just fine tune that and hire some really good artists for Deathbringer and call it a day. That's my thought. Yeah, I feel like art is a, a huge deal. I'm sort of a little disillusioned about creating whole new game systems over and over as well. Most of the rule sets I write are pretty similar to stuff that D&D already has. Um, if I had like an unlimited budget, I think I would probably try and create an adventure um, where I could just go all out on the art in particular, just for example, if you had like a city campaign book where you could hire someone, uh, who's that artist from like the nineties who did all those cutaway books. I'm blanking out on his name now. Um, but a lot of like kids books where it'd be like inside like a Roman city and be like slice away the buildings. So you can see what was going on oh, inside. Cool. Yeah. That. Yeah. Um, so yeah, stuff like that, but like for a whole D and D city where like every two page spread was like another building with like a cutaway and you could see all the people in it and stuff. Uh, that would be amazing. It would be obscenely expensive. Um, but if I had an unlimited budget, that's probably what I would try and do. Uh, Seth? Um, I, I took, I take, I take unlimited budget very differently because <laughs> uh, mine, mine is when it comes to like, like, like game books and all that, if, if you're really going to write me the, the, the blank check from Jeff Bezos or something, then hell i'm i'm actually would love to do something more like an experience i mean hmm. if i could do horror on the orient express on the freaking orient express damn it that's how what i'm gonna do <laughs> uh but i am i am constrained by mortal amounts of money and friends with mortals amounts of money um the other is it is a it's actually not that expensive to have synthetic rubies made you know when you see all those really neat dice that people make you hmm. could make a set of D20s out of actual gemstones, uh, sort of deal. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I would do something like that. I'd have an actual, you know, diamond out of the Demi Lich's eye, you know, <laughs> a dice set. It'd cost stupid amounts of money, and then it would fumble on me, and then I would be really resentful of the stupid amount of money that I spent on it. <laughs> I'm sort of shocked that no one's tried to do that yet, given just the ridiculous dice sets that get kickstarted all the time. Oh yeah, yeah. well you first you first got to steal Gary Gygax's ashes to mix that into the carbon <laughs> to make the diamond. Uh, it, it's unlimited budget, man. <laughs> it's compressed Gary Gygax. It's yeah, yeah, it's all in there. I saw someone who did a set of dice you can buy that was actual human bone, where they would like retire like medical skeletons and then carve the the bones into dice, which is both kind of cool and kind of tasteless. I don't know where I stand on that, but yeah. I think kind of cool, kind of tasteless is probably the, the... <laughs> I, I would need a consent form that this is what that person meant when they said they were donating their body. <laughs> Maybe I should put that in my will, you know, I give my consent to turn my body into role-playing game. Into dice. Yeah, <laughs> to be passed down to my descendants. Um, 
Uh, our next question comes from Zarkov Kowalski, uh, who's a great guy. He's written a bunch of D&D adventures. He wrote uh, Scenic Dunsmouth for Lamentations. Um, and he asks, do you prefer one shots, mini campaigns or old style years long grand campaigns? Uh, I definitely prefer the long grand campaign because I think that's where role playing games really stand out and that, that's where they are able to shine. It's harder and harder to actually do that, though. I've been like most people kind of stuck in uh, 2020 with just doing one shots or doing stuff online with people. But I want to actually start a big one with some friends once uh, all this is over, hopefully. Um, Seth? Um, when it comes to D&D, &D, I actually prefer not giant long campaigns where it's like we do a campaign from the third level because we always started them off at third level because first level just stinks uh, we, to get through like eighth or ninth. And then after that, something else. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be one of those those sagas that goes you know from first to 20th. It's more like five, six levels right here and then so on and so forth. Otherwise, I personally either get uh, tired of, of the campaign. I, I admit it's my own attention deficit. Um, or if I, I feel like I have to protect the characters because I've got this huge campaign invested in it and I never want to accidentally start plot armoring the characters mm. uh, because I don't want to spoil my own campaign. So if I know, if I know it's not going to go for the next few years, it's like, you fell in the lava, man. I'm sorry. You're gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, professor. So I have a campaign that's been running continually since the 1990s. Whoa. So it's, it's long. It's long. And I've played with people that, you know, for, I don't know, 20, 25, 30 years, some of them. But I've discovered, but I love one shots too. I love one shots. I love limited run campaigns like Horror on the Ori Express or Mask of Nyarlathotep where the characters... I've run those campaigns in both instances. There were only two or three surviving characters out of a, we created 12 of them. And I love one shots because they allow you to play with at a convention, complete strangers. I, I just uh, wrote a one shot that's uh, available on, on quest givers called Macbeth. It's based on William Shakespeare's play. And, mm -hmm. and it's, and it's a one shot meant to be done in three hours and the great thing about one shots is you don't have to worry about if everyone is dead at the end so i love all types of games and i think that i might myself i could never plan a campaign like this i've i've tried to start campaigns with the intention of it going a long time and it doesn't but this one just won't die you know it just keeps going and going and it's just a freaky thing it's like you know it just has a life of its own some campaigns is it the same characters that have been all through the nineties or is it like the, the players are recycling and trying new characters out? They occasionally try out new characters and, and replace their characters, but uh, one or two have been going since the 1990s, two of them, two of them out of uh, six players. What level wow. are they at at that point? Only about six. <laughs> <laughs> Do you cap it at six? No, I just, we don't care about experience points really that much anymore. Okay. Like nobody really, if you, if you have a character that's 9th, 10th, 20th level, then you have to have a character that ends. You have to have a story that ends. If you're going to have an open, something that goes forever, the experience points would have to be, it, the experience has to be slower. It's a lot like Star Wars is compo compared to Star Trek. Because Star Trek, you know, it, it's a lot lower technology and there are a lot lower power characters because Star Wars is a six hour movie and Star Trek, you know, with the original Enterprise went on week after week and then all those movies, you have to keep them fairly low levels. And my players don't care about levels anymore, so it's not a problem. Yeah, I can really sympathize with that, especially the idea of keeping them low level. I am i don't like characters when they get above even 10th level. At that point, in at least in fifth edition, uh, you're just too tough. It's almost impossible to kill you. And yeah, it just, drains the the sense of danger out of it for me um i know like in traditional old school play by the time you get to level 10 or so you usually retire the character and they become like a king or a lord they become like an npc and then you just start with another character 
like your fighter got like a, a keep or something at ninth level. And then yeah. all of your non-humans pretty much had to like cap themselves out. Like at ninth, I think was the highest a non-human could get on anything. Yeah. Um, so if you're, if you were going to have like a party of 15th, 16th level characters, they were either all humans or they were running around with a elf that was seventh level mage. And they were just kind of like, well, I, this is it. I live to be a thousand years. And I'm never going to, I'm never going to get that ninth level spell. <laughs> well, I mean, what, one of the plus sides is that, you know, in theory, if you get a lot of your characters high level, then you're now like barons or whatever, and you can start going into domain level play where you're raising armies and you're doing stuff more like diplomacy. Um, I've heard some groups do that, but I think most people just go back down to first level again. Um, Let's see. Oh, so we're about to move on to our next question. But before we do, a quick break uh, for a shout out to today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Into the AM. Into the AM is an apparel store that sells a lot of great t-shirts along with other things that frequently have an old school sci-fi fantasy or a psychedelic flavor to it. One of my favorite shirts is the one I'm wearing right now, which I think would work really well if you're running any sort of sci-fi horror game like Mothership, where it has this astronaut wading through some sort of black goo surrounded by dead planets. All the shirts are really comfortable and they've quickly become some of my favorite shirts to wear. If these look really cool to you, uh, head down to the description below where I will put a link where you can get uh, all of the apparel at their store for 10% off. Thanks again to Into the M for sponsoring us. And now let's get back to the video. And we're back. So uh, moving on to our next question. This one is from Dale Mershey. Is he says, uh, there's a common train of thought that skills in games lead to players looking down at their character sheet uh, to solve problems. Have you noticed this tendency? Does it occur more often when playing skill-based games like Mothership? Um, I haven't actually played Mothership in particular. Uh, I have noticed that in games, at least in my 5th edition games, when uh, there's like a long character list, especially for new players, they often approach a situation and they look at the list of skills and say, which skill should I use for this situation? So I've seen that tendency a little bit. Um, I do prefer it when players just approach the situation as a situation, describe what they would do, and then maybe they get a skill role attached to that. Um, that's a common complaint in a lot of old school circles that like the, the skill list makes people think of game mechanics instead of engaging with the fiction. Um, have either of you noticed something like that? No. No. I'm I'm a skill based player. Like, <laughs> like I, I I I I play almost exclusively skill based games. So yeah, Call of Cthulhu has a lot of those, right? Oh no, Call of Cthulhu's uh, uh, skill based. It came after RuneQuest, which was pretty much the same system. And um, uh, pretty much all my games that I, I actively play are are skill based games. And uh, anytime you do have a new game, like if if you're going to play mothership which i guess is a skill-based game it's so rules light it kind of falls in that nebulous somewhere in between uh if you've got new players they're going to be looking at their character sheet just because they're new players and they're mm -hmm. trying to figure it out but you would have that in just fifth edition DD where your thief is looking down at what their thieves stuff is I, I think once you get familiar with it um that's always going to be an issue of people looking at what they can do but a skill-based game Nope. Uh, we, we we actually find a lot easier to role play those. So interesting. I, I okay. don't buy that story. <laughs> Professor, how skill based are your games? I've noticed it. And this is the strange thing about it. This is the strange thing about it. You got Call of Cthulhu, which Seth loves. And I find it's not a problem in that game. But for some reason in D&D, &D, it slows the whole thing down. Hmm. And I don't know why. I don't know if it's the, the players. I don't know if it's the genre. But it's just, it feels very natural in Call of Cthulhu to look down. And I think because the skills maybe are, are self-explanatory, like drive automobile and electrical repair. Whereas the D&D &D skills are sort of, they're more nebulous. And, and I, I think definitely feats and, skill, and skills and feats. They make players think in a very narrow-minded way. It, it also may have to do with the classes because a Call of Cthulhu character, they're more, it's the modern day. You don't have to, you can punch somebody even if you're not a private detective. But with d and I've, I've had players that if they are not 
a fighter, if they're a spellcaster, the kobold could be right in front of them. And, and I'll be just like, just punch it. Just kick it. It'll die. It's a kobold. And they won't do it. Yeah. They will find a way to cast a spell. They'll, they'll. So I do find it. It actually narrows their range of thought into, like, if there's a skill called acrobatics, you can have a table. You can have a chandelier. They won't jump on the table. They won't swing from the chandelier. They will say, I, I'm not good at acrobatics. I must do what's on my sheet. I have noticed that. But it's it's not the same for Call of Cthulhu, and I don't know why. Well, part of it is I consider I call it because it was like I said, pure skill based. I mean, it's pretty much like I have this profession, and we've all got these skills, but I just mine are higher than this. Uh, like Dungeons and Dragons is a, is a level based or a class based, where I you you're very in these archetypes of I am a wizard and I must do wizard stuff, and I I find that to be the part that's more limiting because you're a class, so you have to approach it where I, I would not punch the kobold because I am a wizard. And it's like, if, if you don't have the class, I think you're more inclined to kind of open up. What would I do here? I, I'd kick that kobold because <laughs> it's pretty much a schnauzer on its hind legs. Might as well kick it. Uh, so that's kind of my take on the difference is if you, if you remove the, the, the actual class from it, it really opens it up because yeah. as cool as classes are and helping define what your role is, it also can become limiting and you feel like you're not supposed to do something that doesn't fall into that, at least for newer players. I, I think when you get to be the, 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 the old people, uh, you're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think I've mostly noticed it when it comes to things like in combat. So skill feats and a lot of like detailed rules for combat where players will look at their feats or look at those sorts of rules. And I think that there's a phrase I've heard before where it's called piloting the mech, where if you have a complex enough game, players will look at their character sheet, like the control panel of like a, a mech. And they're just trying to figure out what button and lever to push in order to make their character do the thing they want it to do. Um, I think that tends to be truer in more complex games than than D and D. But I have seen that sort of thing where, if a character wants to attack like a kobold, they'll look at what feats they can do. Like, oh, is that a? I want. Do I want to do a power attack? Do I want to do this thing? And they're thinking of it in a kind of video game mindset. Whereas if those things weren't there and they just tried to visualize what was actually happening, they might come up with more creative stuff. But and I also really want to echo a statement about feats. I think I think once you start putting in a lot of feats in combat, it it, they're awesome, but they can drag it down because mm. they, they want to use their feats. You know, you can't blame them, but it, yeah, it can slow it down because they feel almost obligated. I'm supposed to, because I've got right. two weapon whirlwind fighting. Like, you know, that, that was a, a discussion or a, I don't know if it's called it a controversy that was on YouTube a little while ago. Cause I think Cody made a video about moving away from Pathfinder um, because of that kind of crunch or his, his complaint was that players, in really build focus systems would build a character and they'd build it to do a particular thing. They'd optimize it. They'd get the right chain of, of feats. They get the right bonuses and stuff. And then whenever they were in combat, they were like, my character is optimized to move forward, do this attack, do this thing, and then move away. And that's the best thing that they can do. So whenever I'm not doing that, then I feel like I'm not doing, I'm not playing my character right. And they would, they would get kind of locked into these modes of thinking. Oh yeah, there's there's that over specialized is what I call that. Where um, I think we back when I used to allow people to like double and triple specialize in D and D. You know, in old D and D, you knew like your fighter knew like four weapons, not classes. It was like I know mace and I know long sword and I don't know any other sword. I just know long sword. And you know, we had you know, more proficiencies to the point they literally only knew how to use one or two weapons. To the, they all of a sudden they kind of became useless unless they were in this ideal situation. And, and I've always been the type I would run them where it's like, okay, I see you really like using a long sword. Let's see what happens if we lose your long sword. Let's see how you act now. And it's like, oh, you're all completely inept all of a sudden <laughs> because you are too, too specialized. So or you, uh, you'd end up with I'll weird agree. situations where like I'm, I'm a master swordsman, but if you put like a mace into my hand, I can't hit anything which is, doesn't make any sense. Like they're basically the same thing. One's just round. Uh, so yeah, you end up with just weird situations. Yeah, um, I mean, on a battlefield, you would always use a mace. 
if you were wearing armor field on a field of battle, it was to, you didn't have space to, to use a sword. You would club people with your mace. And then when the enough people died, you'd say, squire, sword. And then you'd pack <laughs> them up. Like every yeah. fighter, no, it's just a heavy stick. That's all it is. Uh, but I think I responded. I did a response video to Cody's video. And I think it's inevitable that this is the paradox. Players, uh, uh, this is a and d thing. They want more feats because they think it gives them options. They want I want the option to cast this spell and I want the option to cast this feat or do this thing. And those feats are paradoxically limiting because you think, well, if I don't have that feat, I can't do that thing. And then once the feat is invented, then, then if you don't have it, well, then you don't have it to the point where in Tasha's cauldron, I think one of the feats is, is cooking and you're cooking Scooby snacks that heal hit points and uh, to me and and that's the paradox because the it sells more books but your your player character is paradoxically limited because it limited it limits your range of thinking yeah i mean i think we're getting a little off the left field but that's fine i was just imagining the way that i think there's a mentality um with with certain types of players where they're looking for the official system to give them permission to do stuff Right. Where it's like if you have like the feet for cooking Scooby snacks, we're like, well, I couldn't do that if I don't have the feet. Um, but that's just like a different way of thinking about role playing games than, I guess, the old school mentality. I, I, I will say uh, the, the example of Squire fetch me my sword to go back to that hireling thing we talked about earlier. You know, right there. That's a, that's why you need your hireling is your your, your guy to hand your sword after you're done whooping everybody's butt with a mace and the field has opened up a bit so <laughs> there we can we can answer that first question at the same time i mean maces and spears right like most people in medieval combat had spears it's mm. a long stick you could poke someone with from far away oh that was always my problem in like like the, the walking dead and all that like why are they not walking around with spears and halberds like yeah it's, <laughs> just the science of pole arms really <laughs> yeah. really peaked at these I wonder why aren't they wearing leather jackets, human bites? You you can't, the zombies have human jaws. You can't yeah. bite through a leather jacket. Just wear a leather jacket and gloves. You're done. The zombies are over. And a spear. And a spear. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's see. Oh, Lazy Lich has a good question. He wants to know, what is one of the best sessions you have ever played and what stood out about it? Um, Professor, you want to start with that one? I just played one last Friday night. I played it with my youth group online via Zoom. And we uh, we play in this world where uh, one of the players plays a cleric. And so when you play a cleric, he asks, well, what kind of gods are there? And I say, well, Sky Coast is the main god. And you have to answer me this. You have to answer, if you're going to be a cleric of Sky Coast, you got to name one day of the week that you will not do anything. Because if you're a cleric, there's got to be one day you keep holy, and there's got to be one thing you can't eat. So, Cal, what can't your cleric eat? And he said, birds, because birds are sacred. They live close to sky coasts in the sky. And I said, okay, that's great. What about chickens? And he said, um, no, chickens, you, you can't eat chickens. And then I decided that there would be an offshoot branch of the sky Coastians that think it's okay to eat chickens. And the chickens and the non-eating, you know, the chicken eaters and non-chicken eaters are two different factions who hate each other and there are wars fought over this. And we ended up where they tracked down a heretical monk who believed it was okay to eat chickens and they go through the dungeon and every room is a house of horrors. There's chicken soup <laughs> bubbling there, there's chicken nuggets. And, and fried chicken, and then they they go to the dungeon below. They pursue the mad monk to his, his lair, and they go into a laboratory, and there are all these jars and preserved in formaldehyde are his human-chicken hybrid experiments. And then there was a giant chicken monster there. And the kids thought this was the most hilarious thing. They barely survived. Now, I thought up this adventure about 15 minutes before it began. And it all came from they invented a religion with the chickens and and 
they created this. It's something that I never could have created by myself. Like I never would have written this as a campaign. So it's a case of the players creating something that's cool and I ran with it. And those are the best games where I cannot predict the ending and they're almost writing it in terms of giving me the ideas for it. Yeah, th that stuff is the best. Um, I love the idea of just like the heretical pro chicken sect. I think that was like a whole trend in the old school blogosphere recently was just like petty heresies. People came up with like a petty heresy generator where it'd be like, it's just like my religion, except and just like a, a list of just insane, tiny little things that were different that you could start holy wars over. Um, well, one of the, my favorite games that I played was, I think this is before I even played role playing games. Uh, I was at my friend's house as a kid and we had these little miniatures, um, hero clicks, the little superhero miniatures. And we didn't even really know how to play the game, but we saw that there was a dial. There was like numbers on them that you could spin. It's like, they were pretty self-explanatory. And we just started playing out the car scene, the freeway scene from the second matrix movie where it was a superhero fight, but they were on cars on a freeway. And we were basically just spitballing as we went along. When we needed to make a roll, we'd just look at the number on the character and like roll some dice. And there was cars like flipping down the freeway. People were like jumping from car to car. You were shooting through the back of one car towards someone else. It was just magic. It's one of those like things that I've never been able to recapture because there wasn't like a set rule set. We were making it up as we went along, but we were trying to keep the world consistent. It was, it was incredible. Seth, you ever had something like that? Um, well, actually, I say, oddly enough, mine is also another completely pulling it out of our butt situation. <laughs> uh, we were doing a, uh, a cyberpunk campaign uh, where they were all children. Uh, so all of the characters are like 12 and 13 years old. And we ended whatever the adventure was a couple hours before I was expecting. And they were, I was just kind of letting them go. And they decided they their little gang there was a six story mall in their neighborhood and they wanted to skateboard race down all six floors of the mall in the, in the area around or above the um, ice skating ring. And we figured it would probably take about an hour. It went on for four freaking hours. We were done at, at like two 30 in the morning. We're all zombies. It was amazing. And we're all just making it up as, as we went, this just madness. I, None of us could even tell you what the adventure was before that. But whenever we talk about that game, they're like, oh, my God, the mall and all the different crazy stuff that happened on six floors of skateboarding down a crowded mall. The security guards are chasing him and, and, and madness ensued. That was literally the like, we can burn an hour before the game's done. Sure, I'll let you skateboard. So... <laughs> Uh, I, now, one, one thing, going back to Professor Dungeon Master, there was an old uh, Greyhawk adventure. I remember I, my GM put, ran me through when I was a teenager that was a food theme. And I think there was a Colonel Sanders villain. And like there were gummy were bears. <laughs> there was a dough golem called Poppin' Farsh, you know, like the little Pillsbury dough boy. And in yeah. one room, it gets hot and it can turn into a cookie golem. And it's like your little friend. So <laughs> the whole time I was like, it's going to be Colonel Sanders. He's going <laughs> to lead up to Colonel Sanders. It's going to be great. Like, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> um, oh, Chris Rittner wants to know uh, what, in your opinion, are the best single dungeon zines or books? like a one dungeon that can be dropped into a D&D &D campaign with minor tweaking. And I assume he means like a one shot uh, type of deal. Um, I think one of my favorites is most of the dungeons written by Gavin Norman for his Dolmenwood campaign. So he has one called Winter's Daughter and one called The Hole in the Oak. And they're great because they're, I'm going to say they're like 60 to 70% vanilla. Like they're pretty straightforward. It's a dungeon. There's some rooms, a lot of pretty normal monsters. But then that last 30 or 40% is just this very whimsical, uh, fantastic tone that is completely unique to him. Um, really gives a sense of wonder and magic to the setting that players, especially new players, get really immersed in. And they're remarkably easy to run. Like they're all done in this bullet point style. So it's really easy to find the stuff that you need. So I really love those. Um, Seth, do you have any suggestions? Well, I don't, I don't know any of the zines, but I can, I can rattle off a bunch of very old modules. Um, 
if it's if 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 we're strictly just looking at a, a dungeon one where we don't have any big story, it's like the old style. You open it up, it's like page one of the dungeon with like a paragraph leading up to it. Um, I would say Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh. I have ran that so many times, or reskinned it, or just ripped off parts of it, just countless times. Um, if it was D and D, and if it was anything. Uh, I would go with the old Call of Cthulhu, The Haunting. So evidently we've got a haunted house thing, but mm. that's another one that you could pretty much drop into any time or anywhere your game is set. It, it's just pretty much like, let's do this right now. And and you don't have to have a big lead up. So, Professor? Yeah, those are great calls. Uh, and I would have picked The Haunting too. Hmm. Like if you need something to run. I got it first. Yeah. <laughs> I would say uh, Ravenloft, I think, is the best one-shot. Mm. Really? You could run it as a one-shot? I always thought it was more of a, a long campaign. It was, oh, no. Yeah, it was always designed as a one-shot. Interesting. It was padded, it was padded oh. to be a... Yeah, they bulked it up because they had something that was badass on their hands. But the, the original Ravenloft... Um, oh, yeah. That's good choice. Good choice. Yeah. Also, also horror haunty. So uh, we got a theme going here. Uh, but Ravenloft, oh, good choice. Yeah, it, it's, it was designed originally to be run as one session. That's really interesting. That's one of the adventures I haven't run or been in yet. I still need to go through. I'm sort of avoiding spoilers. I need to go through Ravenloft at some point. Um, let's see. Oh, Harry Schlatter asks, I was just wondering what your opinion is on level zero funnels. Uh, for people who don't know, that's a type of game, mostly from Dungeon Crawl Classics, where the idea is that instead of starting with one character, you start with four level zero characters. They're like peasants. They have they have nothing. They have like a rolling pin. And you control four of these guys and everyone has them. So it's a big party. And you go through a dungeon and then most of them just die horribly along the way. But hopefully at least one of them makes it alive out the other side. And in the process, you have generated the backstory of how this guy became an adventure and the, the horrors that he went through that brought him into the adventuring life. Um, I have, I usually don't run those. I was in one um, a couple years ago where it was, uh, we were a bunch of child slaves in a dungeon ruled by a kind of uh, Skeletor type of villain. It was in a Thundar the Barbarian type of universe. And I, I played four girls named Teenager So-and-So What's-Her-Face and the Ugly One, or Cheerleader So-and-So What's-Her-Face and the Ugly One. And uh, most, uh, several of them died, but it was a great experience. What Weirdly, what I liked the most about it was playing more than one character at the same time. Because when I had like this little handful of people, I could coordinate them. So if there was a villain, I could have like two of them jump on the guy's arms while someone else was like bashing him in the face. And I don't know, it was really dynamic. Um, Seth, have you ever run something like that? No, it, it sounds like it would be like freaking awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't want to do that as like the normal thing, like like we're starting over and that's just how we always start a campaign. <laughs> but as a as a little treat of like, hey guys, we're going to try something just a little bit different. That sounds pretty awesome. Uh, I still would give the contingency if at the end, if you're all like, nah, screw this, I'm going to make a normal character afterwards. I would still allow that, but... I don't know. I think I think paid a little fat pack of four zero level characters getting out of the slave pits or or whatever, um, or you know off the the Lord of the Flies Island would be freaking awesome uh, just as a, a, a as a one shot and hey maybe you get to keep one. Yeah, well, and you get attached to them because it's like they made it out of this massacre and they're they made it out the other side. And now you love them because they're they they're a survivor, um, professor. My thought is, it's uh, along the lines of Seth, it's, it's fun to do once in a while. If that's the only way you generate characters, like it gets old after a while, but it, it's, it's a hell of a lot of fun. You know, the first time you do it, especially. Yeah. That's the kind of thing. It's the first time you do it, you never forget it. And then subsequent times, it's not as good. It's still fun though. Uh, Michael asks, uh, do you mobilize players to take more risk or how do you mobilize players? My group tends to be very cautious and ignore the routes that lead to dangerous places. Uh, in effect, they usually miss on the more interesting and rewarding parts of the dungeon, for example. Um, Professor, you want to start with that one? You got to have an objective. Hmm. There's got to be an objective to go in a dungeon besides we're going in a dungeon. 
So it's you're you're not going into a dungeon full of cannibals or monsters. It is a dungeon full of cannibals or monsters, and they have prisoners. And they have prisoners, and they have your family members or people from your town, and they're going to eat them. You know, because it's the full moon, it's the night of their ritual, and they're going to ritually sacrifice and eat them if you don't find them. And now they have to go in. There's yeah. got to be some objective of beyond we're going to go into this dark place and just walk around for a while and see what happens. I think that's a really big part of it, having motivation. And I think like another thing that players that, that makes them more hesitant is the kind of fear of the unknown. If there's some sort of nebulous threat, they don't know what it is. They often will avoid taking any risks. So I found that just giving them more information where even if it's a deadly threat, if there are more stuff is signposted ahead of time and they're clearer about what's coming up, then they'll be more motivated to come up with a plan at least for a way to tackle it instead of just avoiding danger at all costs. Um, Seth? Uh, pretty much the exact same thing uh, as Professor Jim. You have, to, you have to give them a reason to do it. Uh, we, we have to go into the big scary room because in the big scary room is the amulet that we need in order to, to do whatever. Uh, that is our goal. Or... Uh, you know, we've got we've got two doors. They're both scary. Uh, let them, you know, maybe give them different hints. Mm -hmm. They can choose which which one they want to do. Both are going to have excitement, but then they're going to find out like, ah, oh, crap, we actually need to go this way to get the key and then this way to get to the door. And, and eventually we're, we're going to throw it. But if you've got some big thing that you want to put into your dungeon that you just can't wait to show them just something freaking awesome then there is no way to do that dungeon without you hitting that specific room. Like, you know, it's, you know, like, dang it. If you go in the dungeon, you have to see that room, uh, other stuff you could bypass, but, but that key thing you really want to show off. Yeah. You're that's, that's where the bad guy is or whatever. Yeah. So. I mean, for more XP motivated players, you can even just put XP on it. Whereas you're going into the dungeon and unless you rescue those people, you don't get XP. That's, they are the XP. So, they can drive them that way. Um, Gerard of Rivia asks, do you use factions in your game? And if so, how do you use them? How many factions per game? So I guess that's a more for a big campaigns. Um, Seth, you want to start with that one? Uh, factions is in like organizations, thieves, guilds. That's yeah, that's sort of these big players in the background that pieces can I interact with. I have, um, you know, I've, I, I usually don't. Uh, it depends specifically on the campaign. I've had, you know, large mercenary companies that they belong to and have rivals. I've done tons of street gangs or, or guilds that they have to work with or overcome or whatnot, but I, they're usually not the focus of, of anything that I do. Um, I think factions are good if you have all the characters belong to a faction. It's a great way to bring in new PCs or allies that can help them out because there are other people in this guild or organization you can bring in, but they're, they're usually not anything that I really mess with. Okay. Professor. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, now I'm not sure if the, the question is about like specific D and D factions, like the Harpers or the Emerald Isle or what is the Emerald Enclave? The, you know, they have those official ones. But in my game, everything is a faction. So you got the chicken eaters and the non-chicken eaters and Skycoats. You have, you have wizards and clerics hate each other. They can't stand each other. The clerics actively, well, the, the, the Church of Skycoats will actively hunt down wizards and wizards will, you, they'll just hate them. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's tension all the time between different groups. If I have two thieves, they're from different guilds. I love factions of all different sorts. Yeah, I think they're just a great way to, like you said, generate tension. And whenever you meet any NPC, if they're part of a faction, then they're going to be in conflict inherently with all sorts of people around them and possibly with the PCs as well. Um, I know that there's some games like Stars Without Number and probably the new game Worlds Without Number too, where there is a whole faction turn where in between sessions, the game comes with a whole set of rules that the game master can use to run the factions in the background, where in between sessions, you actually actually make roles for this faction. And, and if they're in a rivalry with this faction, do they push into their territory? Or are they being pushed back? Um, and so you have a whole game of chess happening in the background between sessions, which is really cool. It's a little bit more work, 
Um, but I think it would really flesh the world out and make it seem a bit more alive. A lot of people recommend that stuff. Um, let's see. Sawyer Young asks, uh, do you use miniatures in your game? And I guess on, on uh, adding on to that, what do you think adding miniatures would add or subtract from running uh, a role-playing game? So just speaking for myself, I usually do use miniatures, but I usually don't use a map or a, a grid. So I, I like having them on there just so that I know the relative positions of the different characters, especially when you're in a big battle. It's really hard to keep track of who's where, who's in front of who, who's in the back rank, unless you have some sort of physical representation. I have a hard time doing theater of the mind with that stuff. Uh, so I like having just something, even if it's pretty bare bones. I don't necessarily need to paint them all up or anything. Um, Seth, what do you use? Well, I'm, I'm a minis guy, mm -hmm. <laughs> as you can see behind me. Um, now miniatures, you know, I don't, I don't do it like, like old scout style war games where we're busting out line of sight lasers or, or tape measures or, or any of that. Um, I, I like the grid because it helps me keep my lines straight when I'm, I'm drawing a room out, but that's, that's mostly for me that I want the grid. I wish I could have it where I was the only one that could see it. Um, they are spectacular for knowing how many people is on this character, how many people is on that. And the players, they can look up and they go, oh, I need to help so-and-so because they're un unconscious and whatnot. But I, I love miniatures. Um, we, we might go two sessions without ever pulling them out. And we are just going theater of the mind, but they are right there at the drop of a hat. Uh, especially in like a dungeon or or large combat, you know, I needed to have the miniatures out just to know: are are you in the room when the trap goes off and the wall drops and starts filling up with water? Uh, because there's kind of the rule we have: when the trap goes off, you are where your miniature is. So they they're kind of a charge of policing where they are because it, it, when the when the when the uh, fireball goes off, and they're like, "Well, I said I wasn't there," it's like your miniature is right there. Uh, yeah. They were very protective of who gets to move their miniature. Um, so yes, but I don't have to use them all the time. And Professor, I know you're really into miniatures. I love miniatures. I don't use a grid, but I do use miniatures for the relative positions. And I'm I'm in, I'm a zoned combat person. If you're in the zone, you know you can go anywhere in the zone and, and hit, hit the monster, but relative positions for the same reasons that Seth said. So like, where is the fireball? And I have a fireball template. And the interesting thing is though, I only for certain games, for fantasy role-playing games, yes. But if I'm running Call of Cthulhu, I never use miniatures hmm. because I find that uh, then once you put miniatures, people are thinking in terms of tactics. And when, when I run Call of Cthulhu, generally um, the tactic is to run away. You know, like, cause I, I, there, there's no, when I'm running horror on the art express, there's no pulling the punches with Fenelik the vampire and he's going to rip your head off and, and you don't even want to be near him. Right. So horror games, I don't use miniatures, but fantasy games, I will. That's really interesting. That's a distinction I hadn't thought of. Yeah. Because doing more theater of the mind, I guess, would, uh, lend towards inducing terror in the players better. They just have to picture it. Um, it looks like we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, Ite Miara, I think you say their name, asks, uh, how do you handle a mid-session character death? Um, so when I'm doing that, I usually just have the players uh, roll up a new character and I find the earliest excuse to get them back into the game again. I tend not to have resurrection or things like that in my game. Um, and I don't like having players just wait out a whole session until it's going to be like narratively appropriate. I usually stretch reality a little bit if I need to, just so that the player is involved again, because um, I don't like that dead time. Uh, Seth? There's a lot of ways I'll do it, uh, but I totally agree. But my goal is to get that person back in the game as fast as possible. We're here to play it. it I'm not going to like kick them out of the game for the session because like, well, Bill died. Sorry, go home. Yeah. Um, if we have henchmen or hirelings or some npc uh i will i will hand them the character sheet and just be like you know you're so and so the footman right now uh if we don't have a character set because sometimes they want to do want to take time to roll up a new character so and you don't want to like have them 
in the other room rolling up a character and feeling rushed for that. Now, if they do have a backup character, because I was encouraged they do have a backup character sheet pretty much ready to roll, we will find a way to bring them in. Sometimes the game doesn't take place in a spot. You can find someone tied up in the next room. You're in the the plane of desolation that no one has been in in 7 million years. There is no one tied up in the next room. If I can't come up with it, we'll, we'll figure it out. But uh, ultimately, we will try to get that person to keep playing as soon as possible if we're mid-session. Because, you know, how bad would that suck? <laughs> They're yeah. just sitting there. Professor? I agree. Get them in as soon as possible. Backup characters. You know, if, if you're going to run a game, the type of game that has mid-death char character death mid-session, everyone should have a backup character. If Again, um, if I'm running Call of Cthulhu, and a good example is Horror on the Earth Express, where they say every character, every player should have three or four characters for this campaign because they're going to die so frequently and you just have them, you just have them come in. And I'll, I'll even have them, I won't even wait a room if, I, if, if there's a way I can manage it. While you're fighting an ogre, whoops, another adventuring party just arrived from another direction and get them in as soon as possible. I remember I, in, in Ravenloft, I had a guy suddenly start rappelling down the big shaft that goes down the stair. It's like the guy died <laughs> two minutes later. This guy just comes rappelling down like, oh, hey, there's someone here. I'll join the party. Uh, so, yeah, they just yeah. walk in. I've done stuff where the a, a character dies in sort of in a big monster fight, like they're fighting an ogre, and then after they kill the ogre, someone like splits the ogre open, and there's like a guy in his stomach who, that the ogre had just eaten. And the guy just like gasping for breath and falls out, <laughs> just covered in guts onto the floor. Hey, it's your new character. There he is. <laughs> that is that is glorious. Yeah, I used to suffer from the issue of uh, I, I was a little too free with resurrections like way back i think in like high school uh, and early college where it was like we did resurrections constantly like you know you, you die you meet your god you have to make a promise to your god you come back and it was like death was just kind of a, a temporary thing and the problem was no one feared it anymore and that's when i realized i i I'd pretty much lost the game is because there was no more consequence but yeah, if, if you're going to have a game where characters can die, they need to have backups written. But I also say like 90% of that backup, like have like a little bit of wiggle room on it so we can kind of like make a few quick adjustments to kind of work them into whatever we're doing. Uh, if there's some skill or something that, that the group might need, we can like, oh, we can stick a few skill points here or a proficiency here and we can tailor it for our need. But yeah, they, they should have something ready if not mostly ready to just keep us going yeah um all right and i think we have time for our last question which is just uh what is your favorite thing to see in a role-playing game supplement this is from colonel crab cake uh we all know you love layout i do love layout but what kinds of things really knock a book out of the park for you um so i guess for me personally when i'm looking at an adventure that's what i'm thinking of in particular here um i'm looking for interactivity above all else so the adventure should give players the freedom to approach it in lots of different ways. There should be uh, NPCs and characters in there, in there with their own motivations so that the game master can determine how they would respond to the player's actions. There should be buttons to press. There should be things that the uh, decisions the players can make that change the adventure dramatically. Uh, if an adventure has that, then it's a good adventure, in my opinion. Um, Professor? The thing I look at is the inside covers. Is there anything written there? Mm. I, hate, I hate books that don't have anything <laughs> on their covers. And maps are really pretty, but I don't need a map. I don't need a map. I want to see the entire game rules on the inside front and back covers. So I can just open it up because that's the place. I don't want paper cuts. I, I want a ribbon so I can find the most important pages. But what I really want is I want to see your entire game on the front and back covers. Yeah, that's something that I've been doing a little bit in the game that I'm writing. I'm writing a short adventure. And what I'm doing is, yeah, I'm using the front and back covers. But what I'm doing in particular is that when you open up the front cover, not only do you get a map of the environment, but you have notes for every room written around the room. So it works like a miniature one page dungeon. So just from reading these two pages, you get a very clear overview of what's going on. And then it goes into more detail throughout the book, but just injecting the adventure into the game master's head as quickly as possible is a big deal. Uh, Seth? 
by the way, that's a, I love that. Cause that's when I write a dungeon, that's what it looks like. It's all crazy notes all around my little map, but yeah. um, for any RPG supplement, it has to inspire me. Um, I don't, I don't care. I, I, I always say I'm a huge fan of art. The art has to inspire me. It doesn't actually have to be the best art in the world, but it has to be something where I can look at it and go, yeah, this is what I want, or I want something like this. And if I do look at a map or a story, I want to feel inspired. Uh, so I don't want it to be cold or bland or cliche or, or something that makes me feel like, yeah, okay, this is this is a, a book or this is an adventure. I, I want it to make me feel that I have to run this right the hell now because it's so good. Or it might inspire me to run something that's not it, but it, you know, I needed this adventure or, or a magazine article in order to run that because it inspired me. And now I recommend it to everybody and nobody else sees what I saw because it just hit me at that right you know, moment at that right angle. So it, I have to feel something when I read it. Otherwise, I'll forget about it and I don't care anymore. So, Sure. All right. That is a great place to wrap up. Uh, thanks to Seth and Professor Dungeon Master for joining me today. I will put links down in the description right below to their channels. Go there and click subscribe on their channels. It is worth it. I am subscribed to both of them. And uh, thanks to both of you for joining me. Thanks a lot, man. See you later, guys.